Hi and welcome to the Vet Dental Show. I'm Brett Beckman, board certified veterinary dentist, and we come to you every Wednesday as veterinarians and technicians in general practice to get you to the point where you are the best you can be in general practice dentistry. Five episodes, we're gonna be transitioning to pain management and we're honored to have Dr. Mark Epstein, veterinary pain management expert, medical director at Total Bond Veterinary Hospitals in North Carolina, and a certified veterinary pain practitioner to join us here. He's a diplomat and past president of the American Board of Veterinary Practitioners and a past president of the International Veterinary Academy of Pain Management. Dr. Epstein also co-chaired the AHA and AAFP pain management guidelines, led the AHA Senior Care Guidelines Task Force, and was awarded the 2022 Vidica Small Animal Educator of the Year Award at the Western Veterinary Conference. So Dr. Epstein recorded these in a live workshop back in 2023, so they're all very recent. All five episodes are categorized based on the agent. They are brief for a reason because there's a lot of information in each one. So please sit back and enjoy Dr. Mark Epstein. All right, let's cover some uh, pain modifying analgesic drugs that are parenteral. All right, let's cover some uh, pain modifying analgesic drugs that are parenteral. And ketamine is one we've talked about it at length about prepared surgical pain. It's pretty much a settled matter, including the kind of a, some unifying protocols which are reproducibly pretty good for both people and the ones we use for dogs and cats. But what about chronic pain? Well, we know that it can work in chronic pain conditions, neuropathic pain conditions. The problem is, is that the, the way it's administered, the, you know, the route, the dose, the frequency, um, for what conditions, for how long, I mean, none of that is worked out on the human side. Uh, so there is no unifying protocol on the human side. We would not expect, obviously, to have one on the canine or feline side as well. Uh, adverse effects, you know, we don't know about that either, because here you're doing it not just once, but repeatedly over time, probably. And maybe if your dog has unstable angina, <laughs> so dogs don't get heart attacks. And so that's what might be worried about with them, with people, but generally considered very safe. The two different ways that are probably being used most predictably. Uh, I'll begin with uh, Dr. Uh, Lindsay Fry here, and she does what really what amounts to, I'm oversimplifying a little bit, but she uses the perioperative protocol and she does that two weeks apart for three times, sometimes more, sometimes less for, for up to three or four months. So she's accruing some data. We hope to see that in print at some point in the future. Then there's this device on the left called the actuator. It's a sub-Q infusion device that the dog kind of wears as a backpack where they can get a 24-hour sub-Q infusion. So with that in mind, uh, more data to come. I think we're going to find there's something to all of this. Um, but in terms of some kind of ideal protocol, that will probably take quite some time to come out. Dr. Fry's technique does use a loading dose, just like with that perisurgical and she just goes ahead and, you know, a lot of the other stuff you see here is for induction um, or pre-medication purposes for surgery, anesthesia and surgery. She just gives a bolus of uh, ketamine uh, that you see here. That's her, her technique. And you might suspect that in an HCM CAD, uh, this would not be something you want to do. Um, but nevertheless, uh, that's how she proceeds with her dogs. You probably have heard about using um, ketamine sub-Q at this point five mix per kig dose once a month. I have two. It comes from this website out of the UK, which is a really good website, to be honest with you. And the, the part that I quibble about it is uh, when it talks about this protocol, because if you go to it, the, the, the site for it right now, even it'll say, there's a story. I, <laughs> it's like, I know a guy. It's like, I, there's, uh, I've heard some people doing this and these dogs seem to get better. And so on. And I have to remind the listeners here about that caregiver placebo effect that half the time, up to half the time you do anything for a dog, even giving it nothing, that is a placebo, they're going to look better to you or to the owner just because of that caregiver placebo effect. The expectation for improvement, the hope for improvement is enough to lend that bias. So th these low doses once a month, um, 
do not strike me as a lot of ketamine, maybe slash enough ketamine, uh, whatever that means. I'm putting in air quotes here. Um, it's inexpensive and it's uh, safe to do. I would not dispense syringes to the owner to do because ketamine is a scheduled drug and can be diverted and abused. Uh, nevertheless, there you go. Have I used it? I've tried it. I'm a little underwhelmed, to be honest with you, but I'm just one person. So there you go. I think it, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention it and let you know that it's out there. Another parenteral drug is meripotent. And I mentioned in my uh, original presentation that there was um, data that suggested that there was a pain modifying effect. But uh, as it turns out, when you look at um, the whole, um, the big picture, it just is not um, uh, looking at dogs and cats that there's a max bearing effect, but there's not a lot of evidence that it a, has a pain modifying effect. When you try to separate patients that are feeling better post-op, is it because they're not uh, more, they're, they're feeling less likely to have to throw up or they have a better appetite versus less pain? That's hard to tease out. So this systematic review says, you know what? It can reduce anesthetic requirements, but doesn't seem to have an effect on inflammation and pain. But here's my but, big but, is that these studies upon which the systematic review was based, they were all SPAYs, SPAY models. And, you know, substance P and K1 that it binds to, you know, it doesn't really upregulate. It doesn't really kind of figure into pain processing unless there's sensitization. I mean, it's part of the sensitization process, central sensitization in the spinal cord. So does a spay in a, in a well-done ovariohysterectomy, would or does a spay cause sensitization? In, in other words, would where substance P and NK1 is involved? I, I don't know. I, I wouldn't think so, actually, to tell you the truth. So this is not the best population of patients to study it in. So what if we were to kind of narrow the scope of patients that we were thinking about and say, okay, well, what about patients that were, were getting a visceral pain, like pancreatitis pain, for example, or reception and astomosis, that type of thing. And for patients that had a lot of soft tissue damage, you know, these were where sensitization occurs. Well, let's take an example because we actually have a study to look at it. So these are dogs undergoing mastectomy um, for, uh, I beg your pardon, this was a, a study since a systematic review, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, looking at morphine, meripotent, and dexmedetomidine. And the upshot is, is that adding the meripotent in, the serenity in, was additionally anesthetic sparing and spared opioid as well. So that's kind of a hint that it may have some pain modifying effect. This is the one I was just going to reference, that these are dogs getting mastectomy. So a lot of soft tissue damage, right? Radical mastectomy. And essentially, in the dogs that were given meripotent IV and then followed by a CRI, CRI, that it was able to um, have these patients more comfortable post-op than if they had not received the meripotent. Their pain was less. So with that in mind, I think that lends credence to the idea that in a subpopulation of patients, visceral pain and patients where you would suspect um, a, a central sensitization component, wind up, if you will, that meripotent not only can help with uh, you know, maintaining appetite post-op, but also decrease vomiting, but also have a pain modifying effect. And that may not even be the end of the study story because um, meripotent may be delivered in other ways. This begins to talk about nanoparticles and all of these studies that you see here are talking about meripotent delivered in, through nanoparticles. And so it seems that if we can change the way that we're giving it through a different technology, in fact, that the likelihood of it eliminating, uh, of being a pain modifying appears to kind of go way up without going into all the technical uh, pharmacology of uh, nanoparticles, it seems to have that kind of effect. I really hope you enjoyed that episode. If you are a veterinarian and you wanna be one of the best in dentistry, in general practice and take your team to that level as well. The Veterinary Dental Practitioner Program can get you there. Please visit IVDI.org and put in an application today and hopefully we'll see you soon in the future in our meetings and in our virtual extraction wet labs. We'll see you next week.